Hi guys, Dane here, and it is time for that special video. I do once a year where I take my year favourites, and uh, I have basically I do these videos where I have my quarterly favourites for three months. Each of those is uh, ten books. I bring them all together, and this is my forty top books of the year 2020. So without further ado, let's get started. So number forty. Wilt Haven by Ollie Jacobs. This is an indie novel, a bit of a horror novel. It's kind of like a found footage style thing. Uh, basically all of these dossiers about this uh, strange town called Wilt Haven. It's very quirky, kind of Lovecraftian, but also with some humorous vibes in there as well. And I did enjoy it. And then we have Aesop's Fables by Aesop. So I read this as a bedtime book. There were about 280 pages or something. And I was reading like 20, 30 fables a night, just getting through it bit by bit. There were some that stood out more than others. A lot of them I already knew because of popular culture references and stuff like that. But I'm definitely glad I got to it. And um, yes, one that's ticked off. Then we have The Ardlement Mystery by Daniel Smith. So this is a non-fiction book and it's about a real life uh, mystery. Uh, that happened, I think in Scotland, uh, I believe it was a murder, and it kind of covers the trial and the investigation, but also it talks about how the characters involved with this were, uh, and these real people were like the inspiration for uh, the Sherlock Holmes books. So yeah, fascinating if you're a Holmes fan. Then we have Notes from a Big Country by Bill Bryson. Bill Bryson is a sort of humorous travel writer. I previously read uh, Notes from a Small Island, which is his travels around the UK. Notes from a Big Country is his travels around the US. Uh, he's like, I think he's a British citizen, but he's American born and uh, yeah, it's really interesting to kind of see him looking out at America through his eyes. Then we have a bit of a blur by Alex James. Alex James was the bassist of Blur, the uh, sort of Britpop band of the 1990s. And this is just his memoirs really. Um, quite a lot of fun. There's some, you know, pictures in there and all that kind of stuff as well. He was, uh, he talks a lot about his sort of addiction to champagne. He was specifically addicted to champagne. Um, and then later on he got into cheese farming. Then we have One Hit Wonderland by Tony Hawks. This is a sort of another non-fiction humorous travelish book uh, basically in this book tony hawks tries to get another british number one because he did previously have a, a novelty number one song and uh yeah he ends up teaming up with norman wisdom i believe and gets like number one in albania or something like that very humorous definitely recommended then we have a lives of the stoics by ryan holiday and stephen hanselman so this is a non-fiction book about the stoics the branch of philosophers who are the, they basically preach that like we can only really control our own thoughts and actions. We can't control other factors. And so rather than stressing about, say, the coronavirus, well, there's nothing really I can do about that apart from to sanitize my hands. So it's you kind of look past that. And this is the very real stories of the philosophers who inspired this movement. Then we have Switch Bitch by Roald Dahl. This is a collection of four short stories that were originally published in Playboy magazine. Not many people realise this, but Roald Dahl also wrote uh, fiction for adults as well as fiction for children. So these are kind of erotically charged humour stories for adults. Then we have The Bodleian Library, Instructions for British Servicemen in France, 1944. I picked this up at Bletchley Park and it's a reproduction kind of facsimile of a handbook that was given to actual British servicemen who were going out to France during the Second World War. One of the most interesting things about it, I think, is, uh, is that it, it tells you more about the people it was aimed at than the country they were going to. So even though it's a guide to France, it tells you a lot about British servicemen and like their attitudes. And it says like the Germans have actually treated the French quite respectfully, so we need to do the same. Then we have The Diamond As Big As The Ritz by F. Scott Fitzgerald. This is a collection of short stories. The titular short story is about a diamond that's literally as big as the Ritz. It's kind of buried beneath this mountain. And um, we discover what this kind of source of wealth means, like they have to keep it hidden and they have to only release diamonds very slowly because otherwise they'd flood the market. That's only one of the stories in the collections that overall pretty good collection would recommend. Then we have Julius Caesar by William Shakespeare. I read this in the uh, Folio Society edition, so that kind of helped my enjoyment. But also I'm a bit of a history nerd. And um, I mean, some of the uh, philosophers in the, in the Stoicism book were um, knocking around, like I think, uh, Portia Cato was one of them, and she was the wife of Brutus, who, who stabbed uh, Caesar, the one who was like, Etu Brute? Was it? Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's just a really iconic play about a really iconic piece of history, and it's just a subject I'm already interested in, so having it in a Shakespeare play was just the icing on the cake. Then we have Trash Panda by Lisa Cantoral. So this was a collection of bizarro short fiction. 
Uh, Lisa Cantor is married to Christophe Paul, who also writes under the pseudonym of Mandy DeSandra. He does like Bizarro. Hers were like not as extreme, so they almost had more of a literary air to them and were just a very interesting um, and experimental collection of short stories with a cool cover. Then we have The Death of Expertise by Tom Nichols. This book is basically about how expertise is no longer a thing. Uh, it points are like people are less likely to listen to their own doctor and more likely to go and listen to Gwyneth Paltrow, you know, and why people end up going for weird like hippie cures when they've got cancer and stuff and end up dying because of it. Uh, very important read, especially today in the era of fake news. Then we have The Breakdown by Tatton Spiller. So this was a book about like the breakdown in society basically and how like society is becoming more and more polarized and how a lot of it is actually a breakdown in communication. Sometimes people agree on things but they still fight over them. And uh, again, another very important 2020 read, I think. Then we have Sword of Destiny by Andrzej Sapkowski. Um, just slowly working my way through the Witcher books. This one happened to be in one of my top 10 lists one month. I suspect it's possibly because I didn't read as many good books in that quarter. But um, yeah, the Witcher's all right. I tend to enjoy, again, like the philosophy and the questions it asks in it more. A lot of the things about morality, like is it right to kill this monster just because it's evil, blah, blah, blah. Uh, yeah, then we have The Outsider by Albert Camus, so the second book called The Outsider on this list. And I did read Stephen King's The Outsider as well, but it didn't make it onto this list. The Outsider is a novel. Uh, Camus has a very interesting fiction writing style, but he also is kind of one of those books where not too much happens. It's very much a slow burner, but again, it does ask a lot of questions of the reader. And I think that's a common theme throughout the books I've enjoyed this year. Then we have The Breakdown by B.A. Paris. This is pretty much just a straight up thriller. I've read a few of B.A. Paris's other books before and she's actually one of those authors who I think is really good. So you've got, you know, your Girl on the Train and Gone Girl and all these books. I think B.A. Paris as a thriller writer is way better than most of those other authors. Um, Ruth Ware's maybe my like second favorite and even then I find a lot of problems with her books. But yeah, B.A. Paris, The Breakdown, it's about um, a woman sees a car that's broken down and uh, she decides not to stop and later on she discovers a person in that car was murdered. Definitely worth reading. Then we have Poirot Investigates by Agatha Christie. I can't remember too much about what happened in this already, but as you can tell, it's a Hercule Poirot book. So I guess that's pretty much a good enough reason for it. This year, I finished off reading all of Agatha Christie's books. I actually still have some of her Mary Westmacott books, which are the ones she wrote under a pseudonym, but I've read all the ones she published under her own name. And Poirot Investigates being this high up in the list was one of the ones I enjoyed. Then we have It Came From Ohio by R.L. Stein. So R.L. Stein is the creator of Goosebumps. He also created Fear Street. And this is his autobiography. It was written about five years ago. It kind of coincides with the creation of the Goosebumps movie. So he talks a little bit about like Jack Black playing him and stuff. But he also talks a lot about his childhood and he covers like, he used to make these magazines when he was a kid and it kind of, he talks about some of the old stories he wrote and shows you the covers and all that kind of stuff. So pretty cool. Definitely one to read if you're a Goosebumps fan or you're a writer. Then we have The Armageddon Rag by George R.R. R. Martin. I can't remember too much about this, except that it was to do with music, I believe. There was a band in it called the Nazgul, uh, named after the Lord of the Rings thing. And uh, I really like this because this is like a more serious version of a book that I've written called Monsters of Rock. I haven't edited it yet, um, but my book is about like this band that basically, it's like Spinal Tap meets Lord of the Rings. Whereas this was much more like, Train spotting meets Lord of the Rings. <laughs> but yeah, I did enjoy it, would recommend. All right, next up we have Haunted by Chuck Palahniuk. Uh, unfortunately, I can't remember this book. I just remember the way it made me feel and I did enjoy it. I believe this was the one about the bunch of different people all went away to like a writing retreat together. And uh, I, I, yeah, it was good, let's just say that. Then we have The Wind Up Bird Chronicles by Haruki Murakami. Another one I don't remember too well uh, in terms of the specifics. Again, it's more I just remember the way it made me feel. Murakami has a great writing style. He does this kind of inimitable brand of magical realism. Definitely worth checking out. Then we have a Losing My Virginity by Richard Branson. So this is his autobiography. He talked a lot about his ballooning adventures and his attempt to set world records and various bits and bobs like that. So that made it pretty cool, I thought. And um, yeah, I read it. Uh, right at the start of the year I think actually I seem to remember reading it on my way back from my nan's funeral but yeah it was interesting and I learned a lot of stuff and like particularly about Virgin Records which I thought was cool 
Then we have Gerald's Game by Stephen King. Uh, this one I'd actually seen the movie of it before I read the book. It's basically about a sex game gone wrong between a couple. A husband handcuffs his wife to the bed then has a heart attack and dies and it's kind of follows her story. So because of that it's quite slow burn but it's also interesting in a Stephen Kingy way and it's not too long. Perfect length I think to tell the story. Then we have The Myth of Sisyphus by Albert Camus, so this is one of his non-fiction books and uh, The Myth of Sisyphus is that Sisyphus used to have to push a boulder up a hill every day and uh, Camus basically talks about absurdism and the idea that there's no meaning to life, we're all just randomly here and so we kind of have to find our own meaning and uh, one of the ways we can find meaning is to commit suicide, another way is to find it through art and he relates like Sisyphus pushing this boulder up the hill back to us having to go to work, come home, sleep, Pete, you know. Then we have Dance Macabre by Stephen King. This is a non-fiction book about like, the, I guess the origins of horror. It's kind of outdated now because he wrote it towards the start of his career. And like he even mentions at one point, he was like, nobody's written a story about a haunted car. And I'm reading it being like, Stephen, mate, you've done two of them. So um, yeah, I think it was published about 1972. It's good for like this background in like, if you want to learn more about like Lovecraft and all those like, and, like early things like the Twilight Zone and all that stuff, it's kind of worth a read. Then we have Creative Blindness by Dave Trott. Dave Trott is an advertising guy and Creative Blindness is just one of his many books that he has out where he talks about advertising. Um, and he tells them in a real, he tells stories of other things like stories about the Titanic or about people during the war. Or one of my favorite stories was um, a guy was so scared of the exorcist that he threw it into Brighton Pier and then Dave Trott bought a copy of it, ran it under the tap and put it under the guy's, into the guy's desk to scare the crap out of him. Uh, it's one of those books that's just good for giving you ideas and changing the way you look at the world. Then we have The Positronic Man by Isaac Asimov and Robert Silverberg. This is basically Silverberg taking one of Asimov's um, short stories and turning it into a no novel, basically. Asimov himself was kind of involved in it, but not really. He actually, I think, died either the same year or the year after it was published. But it's basically a novel version of Bicentennial Man, so it's cool. Then we have The Pretty Boys of Gangster Town by Martin Gray. This is a poetry collection. I just really enjoy his work. Uh, I think it helps that I've seen him perform some of it on the Fly on the Wall Poetry Press YouTube channel. So I kind of read it in his voice. I've also interviewed him for the art show and uh, overall pretty cracking indie poet. Then we have Cat's Cradle by Kurt Vonnegut. Another one, can't really remember uh, the details. I just remember I enjoyed it. And I do hope to read some more kind of uh, Kurt Vonnegut soon. In fact, I have some more on my shelf over there. Then we have The Mysterious Affair at Styles by Agatha Christie. Somehow I hadn't read this one. Um, I basically was spoiled for it because I kind of knew what was going to happen, but it was my first read of it and I did very much enjoy it. So that's why it's so high up in this list. Then we have Master of Reality by John Darnell. So this is part of a series that was created to tie in um, with like physical records. So Master of Reality is a Black Sabbath record. And this is uh, basically an epistory novel told about, uh, told from the point of view of this kid. He gets thrown into like an institution for troubled kids. And all he wants is his Black Sabbath takes tapes and, and they, they won't give them to him. So the first half is, is like his journal that he keeps there. And the second half is a series of letters he writes to his former counselor. And I really like that because it re reflects the way that vinyls have an A side and a B side. Plus the writing style changed between the two, which was very impressive. Then we have The Power by Naomi Alderman. And um, this, this was a feminist book that I enjoyed reading a lot. And I can't remember any of the details. I'm very sorry. Uh, it was, I believe, either dystopian or post-apocalyptic. Wasn't it dystopian? That was it. And then women ended up coming to power at the end of it. And there was this great bit at the end where it was like, oh yes, well women have always been so aggressive because they had to defend their babies. And it was just like showing the bullshit that people come up with for, to justify their gender assumptions and shit. All right, then we have Transcript by Haim Rabbaka. This is a poetry collection and all of the poetry is like blackout poetry based on uh, documents that the Nazis kept during the Holocaust. So as you can imagine, that makes it very powerful, very moving, very haunting, very beautiful. Then we have The Institute by Stephen King. Uh, this is a book that's very reminiscent of some of his earlier stuff, like Firestarter in particular. Basically, there's this government institute where kids are being kidnapped from their parents and taken there for this like series of tests and stuff. And this novel, we find out what's going on and we follow one of the kids. Uh, lots of high tension stuff in there. Uh, kind of, It's one of those books that kept me hooked from start to finish. Then we have A Bicentennial Man by Isaac Asimov. So this is actually the short story collection named after the short story that the Positronic Man was based on. Uh, Asimov's short stories are always great. Uh, the Bicentennial Man was a great short story even though I'd already read the longer version of it in the novel and I've also seen the movie. 
But I also just liked Asimov does these great essays in between uh, like introductions to each of his pieces. So it was a lot of strong stories, but a lot of interesting stories behind the stories as well. Then we have Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel, a post-apocalyptic novel. What struck me about this in particular, I read this in like maybe April, and she predicted that people were going to stockpile toilet rolls. So this book takes place following a band of wandering minstrels after this like global pandemic has wiped a bunch of people out. Very prescient read for now, very beautifully written, very well done, and honestly, the, a number of things she got on the nose. I think people who like that book and who haven't reread it since the start of the pandemic should go back and reread it and look at it fr with fresh eyes, with post pandemic eyes. Then at number two, we have Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead by Olga Tokarczuk. This was one of the last books that I read this year, and so it was super close. I got a copy of it as an early Christmas present from my other half, so thank you, Susie. And I read this kind of as a buddy read with Charlie, Charlie Heathcote. It's basically kind of literary fiction, cozy mystery sort of, translated from Polish. Uh, the characters in it are into like translating Blake, and it gets the title from Blake. And uh, there's a delicious twist at the end. And overall, just a very well done book, very well translated, and I enjoyed it. Which leaves me with my top book of the year, and that is The Virgin Suicides by Jeffrey Eugenides. So I wasn't expecting to like this anywhere near as much as I did. In fact, I think I only picked it up as a whim. And it was just so beautifully written, and it sort of satisfied my craving for horror, but also just was like a masterclass in writing for me. I was so impressed by it. I need to read some more Jeffrey Eugenides. I am a little bit intimidated because I think like he gets a bad rep from a lot of people as well and there's stuff like Middlesex which I think is massive and hard to get through. But um, yeah, I was very, very impressed with The Virgin Suicides. So there we have it, those are my top books of 2020. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books and if so, what you thought of them. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.